Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Doug Harrington. I'm from the U.S. Maritime Administration. I am a, the Deputy Associate Administrator for Federal Sea Lift um, and the Ready Reserve Force Program Manager at MARAD Headquarters. Thank you all for coming today to this Sea Lift Recapitalization Discussion Panel. Uh, I wanna first thank the Navy League for having this on board and thank the panel guests who are all here to support us today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start with just a few introductions of hey, who, who the folks are that are with us. We'll have a scene setter from Dr. Eric Labs, and then we'll get into some opening remarks from the panelists for kind of what their functional areas are that they're working on. So today, uh, I'll say that the title of our discussion is Sea Lift Recapitalization, a Critical Analysis of America's Military Sea Lift Capability. Hidden behind the mesmerizing war fighting platforms of a modern American military is a tactical vulnerability so severe it could cripple our major war fighting effort. It's an alarming Achilles heel uh, in our military sea lift capacity, and it's the bedrock of our resupply operations for any prolonged conflict. So without an adequate fleet, we can't transport all of the items needed to keep the enemy at bay, and America will find itself at the mercy of a better resupplied foe, able to dictate the pace and ferocity of our fight. Uh, this is especially true of a modern great power conflict in which distributed forces will have even less capacity for storage and transport of vital supplies. So please join us for this panel of expert discussion uh, on the implications of this deficiency and for options to address in a timely manager, ma manner as we go forward. So I have the pleasure today to introduce Rear Admiral Doug Schofield from US Coast Guard. He's the Director of Acquisitions. He's from my immediate left. Uh, also, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Mike Roberts from the Hudson Institute. And I have the pleasure of uh, once again um, saying hello to Dr. Eric Labs from the Congressional Budget Ob Office. So at this time, I'd like to open the floor up to uh, Dr. Labs kind of for a scene setter. Why are we here today? What are the issues that we have to face? And then we'll go into some introductory remarks from each of our panelists. Dr. Labs. Um, thank you. I just want to start off by saying that um, um, the remarks I make here today are my own, not those of any member of the U.S. Congress or, or, or the legislative branch. Uh, just talking briefly that I work for the Congressional Budget Office, which is an independent, uh, nonpartisan agency of the Congress. So in that sense, I work for the legislature. I do not work for the executive branch. And I want to get it and in that in the CBO requirement, um, I can't get in the business of sort of making recommendations or, or, or policy. We can, we can look at policy options, discuss advantages and disadvantages and, and costs, but uh, we don't make recommendations, unlike, say, for example, the General Accounting Office, the Government Accountability Office, that shows my age, um, <laughs> uh, where, they, where they very much are mandated to do that. Um, I was gonna sort of begin my remarks by talking a little bit about uh, shipbuilding uh, writ large and sort of where we are, where the, the Navy is at, and then moving towards a, a couple of brief comments on the, on the sea lift program. Um, as probably many of, these, many of you in this audience are quite, a, are quite well aware, uh, Congress has actually been, and the administration really, uh, over the past 10 years, even in this era of sort of the Budget Control Act, have actually been very supportive of shipbuilding. So in this period of the Budget Control Act from about 2013 uh, to 2021, uh, shipbuilding accounts were being uh, increased each and every year with, the, with budget requests for, for most years during that time period. And then in addition to that, the Congress was then going ahead and then adding additional funds on top of what the administration request for shipbuilding to the point that sort of over that 10 year period from about 2013 up until, up until today, um, Congress would appropriate an average of about $2.2 billion more per year for shipbuilding over, an, over the entirety. And then um, even more recently, they have been appropriating up to $2.7 billion above the administration request for the last couple of years. And this past year, it was $4.1 billion above. Um, that being said, the, all of the Navy's sort of recent shipbuilding plans and, and sea lift fits into this, into this context of the Navy shipbuilding plan. All the Navy sea lift shipbuilding plans of the recent years are gonna cost a lot more to, um, to implement than what the Navy has been being, what has been, Navy has been appropriated over that past 10 years or even in, in the most recent year. So for example, you know, the CNO's recent declaration that he wants 500 ships and unmanned systems, including 12 aircraft carriers, 
in doing that, he's sort of taking the most expensive features of the recent shipbuilding plans and putting them into one sort of idea or proposal. I don't know that that's going to look like the fiscal year 20, 2023 shipbuilding plan when it comes out, but you took the 12 aircraft carriers from the fiscal year 2020 plan, you added it to the hundreds of ships and unmanned systems of say the Trump December, the late Trump administration's December 2020 shipbuilding plan, and you're talking about needing an average shipbuilding budget of $34 billion a year, every year or so, for uh, decades at a time. Um, and in addition to that, then the Navy top line itself would have to grow in real terms um, over the next 30 years to buy, to equip, to operate and maintain um, that larger fleet. So in that context, where does strategic sea lift capitaliza recapitalization come in? Well, it actually represents a very small amount of resources no matter how you wanna sort of cut it, whether you wanna cut it with new ships, new ships, or some combination of the two. Um, the cost to buy the Navy sea lift recapitalization plan, which they had last outlined in the December, in the uh, fiscal year 2020 shipbuilding plan, well, that represents about 1.6% of the ship recapitalization costs of the entire Navy shipbuilding plan. So if you're talking about a shipbuilding plan that's somewhere in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars over 30 years, it was 1.6% of that. And if you want to concentrate the sea lift recapitalization, say in the next 10 years, so you got to buy a lot of ships, whether it's used or new, in a, in a relatively shorter period of time, and you only want to focus it on the next 10 years or so, even then you're only talking about you know, 5% or so of the total Navy shipbuilding plan over that time period. So sea lift recapitalization, uh, an important element of the Navy's fleet, an important uh, uh, overall maritime forces, an important element to the joint force to be able to resupply not just naval forces and air forces, but also land forces, represents a relatively small amount of money in a context of a very, uh, very large amount of spending that the Navy would do on shipbuilding. One, one or two last comments on this. To, you know, to afford this larger and more distributed fleet that the Navy has been talking about in this conference and elsewhere for several years now, you know, there's only a couple of ways that we're gonna get there. I mean, one is obviously the Navy gets a larger budget and that larger budget includes then you know, larger shipbuilding uh, budgets for a considerable period of time to be able to implement that shipbuilding plan. But you know, I'm not sure how well that, I mean, there's a consensus to, to spend more on shipbuilding, but at the same time, we do have a budget that has come out this year that proposes to reduce the fleet by 24 ships and then it proposes to buy eight additional ships. Not nine, eight. That ninth ship was authorized in, in fiscal year 2020. Um, and, but the problem that we're having now is we can see in the news every day, you've got the Ukraine, which is a, uh, you know, an invasion by one of the world's largest ground powers of, by Ukraine, of Ukraine is not necessarily gonna make the strength in the Navy's case to build a, a larger shipbuilding fleet compared to the sort of the other national security, national security resources and demands that are, that are gonna face the nation. Uh, my last point that I'll make, and before I turn it over to, to, to my fellow panelists here, is that the other way to sort of obviously get a larger shipbuilding budget is to sort of make trades, trades with inside the Navy's budget and shipbuilding accounts. So if you think you need this larger and more distributed fleet, and, you need, and, that, and part of that is going to include the recapitalization of sea lift, because you certainly aren't gonna be able to sustain and operate a much larger and distributed fleet if you don't have uh, the various elements of logistics and support to uh, support, those, support those ships. Um, then the only place that, that money is gonna come from in the absence of a larger budget is frankly, the larger ships in the Navy's shipbuilding plan. You're not going to have a 12 aircraft carrier fleet going to be hard to maintain an 11 aircraft carrier fleet if you're going to have to be able to build that larger, more distributed fleet from inside the Navy's top line, and that top line does not grow in any significant sense. It's not just carriers, it might be other ships, other large ships in the fleet too, but any way you look at it, larger budget is on the one hand, trades inside the Navy's uh, budget on the other hand, either way, uh, those represent um, considerable challenges that, that, that the sea services are going to have to face in, in the near future. So that's all for my scene setting and opening remarks. Um, I look forward to the comments of the rest of my panelists. Thanks, Dr. Lab. So uh, with that kind of mindset and framing, thank you. Um, we, we turn to uh, Admiral Schofield from the Coast Guard, kind of for our perspective, another civilian department, military service at all times, some of the acquisition items that we have that are going forward and how that alignment can be. So Admiral Schofield, if you could give us some insight into what the Coast Guard's perspective is. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Doug. And uh, just for awareness, uh, uh, my position in the Coast Guard, I am the uh, Chief Acquisition Officer uh, for the Coast Guard. 
And under, under my uh, directorate is, uh, I own programs, so buying ships, uh, aircraft, and C5I systems, uh, as well as support services, uh, research development and innovation also come under this, and then uh, contracting policy uh, throughout the whole Coast Guard. So just to give you that, that sense here. So interesting, so why am I up here? Uh, because I, I certainly see lift supports uh, in time of conflict, the Coast Guard can be chopped or work for the Navy. Um, and we've done that uh, through history, obviously very important. But we also, and I'll talk about some of these highlights on how we support uh, the logistics uh, uh, needs for both uh, Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Corps moving ahead. And I think that's really, really important uh, there. So I think just maybe taking it up Taking that up a level from a shipbuilding perspective, there's no doubt that the uh, sea uh, lift um, recap is going to be really important, uh, given the logistics challenges out there uh, in the future. Uh, there, I think importantly across uh, the Navy, Coast Guard, uh, DOT, um, and and industry, we need to continue to partner together and lever leverage our expertise on the best way uh, to understand the priorities in the shipbuilding and logistics pipelines. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those pieces, but I think it's really important to continue to talk in that strategic lens, Doug, as we go uh, moving ahead. Um, <clears throat> with that, I think it's, there's a great opportunity out there in that strategic lens is that we continue to look at commonality, system commonality, uh, in the, both in the sea lift, uh, Coast Guard and Navy, which we're already working, but I think it's across all those lines out there on that system, uh, Piece. And I think that's very important because uh, what I'm really proud of is in the Coast Guard, we're partnering with uh, the Navy and Marine Corps for a common logistics uh, system of the future. So we are working with the, 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 uh, the uh, Naval Maintenance Repair and Overhaul side and the Naval Operational uh, Supply System integration. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. So uh, the past, we, we synced our logistics systems from a national stock system perspective, and now we're gonna get into configuration management and total asset visibility across all three uh, uh, branches, uh, which is really, really important. Why is that important? Because if we get that synergy and get that main uh, data as a service out there and, and uh, really capture artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, we can actually optimize our, our sea lift uh, footprint as well as capitalize on our storage, our collective storage uh, facilities uh, worldwide. So I think that's all part of this system of systems equation thing, but I'm really excited there. This is long, long time coming, great opportunity for the Coast Guard to really work there and work our logistics uh, sense in times of peace and times of war, both are, are critical uh, there. And just for awareness too, uh, as we get, get uh, through the panel, uh, Coast Guard does do a lot of uh, uh, specialties to help the DOD operations and the, the sea lift capabilities in a conflict scenario. Well, we provide, if you didn't know, we provide port security uh, units and support of those on either end of the pipeline uh, out there. And uh, we have deployable teams. Uh, we have maritime safety and security teams that are, that are trained, particularly uh, around the US. And then we have reserve units that do a lot of port security abroad. And we've done that and uh, always done that in time of conflict. We also do uh, ATON, obviously important there uh, for the safety of the sea lift and the, the operation, the logistics pipeline and the operations there. Um, and uh, that's, that continues to be important. Uh, uh, we also have, uh, you may know, we have six uh, fast response cutters uh, in the Persian Gulf and Bahrain that support really keeping commerce going in that, uh, in that region which is really, really important, same as uh, a sea lift or, or other logistical operations. Our latest ships are, have common DOD systems, so we can help support the security of, of those uh, logistics operations and sea lift operations moving, moving ahead, uh, which is really a, a positive step forward. So I think continuing that synergy on that system of systems across services is, is very vital to optimize the needs for the sea lift as well as to optimize the, the, uh, the logistics footprint um, uh, around the world to, to get better logistics uh, for the fleet uh, and our, our men and women serving in uniform. So with that, back to you, Doug. Thanks, Admiral. So, uh, and I'll remind the audience too that um, the DOT operates a number of sea lift vessels. We're gonna be about 50 sea lift ships in about two years. 
They are all civilian manned, so they're operated by contractors, and it's the U.S. Coast Guard that comes and does the marine inspection. We're all certificated as, as, as merchant vessels are, so we require that, that, onboard, um, that onboard footprint from the Coast Guard to get underway, and we have a five-day timeline to do it, so it's critical. We rely on the Coast Guard. We have an MOU with them that's very comprehensive, so we look, look forward to that continued work. Um, uh, we, we do host a, a number of Coast Guard events. Uh, we do host inspectors from the, from the Marine Inspector Service. For We actually have riveted ships in our fleet still, so uh, <laughs> if we, we have to train people on how to do that. And steam so, ships. Yes, we do. So thank you, Admiral. So um, at this time, I'll, I'll open it up to Mike Roberts from a, a little bit of a commercials perspective. So Mike, formerly of Crowley and now with the Hudson Institute. Mike, please give us your insight here today right. for what the problems are that we're going to face. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I appreciate uh, the introduction. Uh, it's great to be with you, Admiral Schofield and, and Dr. Labs, and, and uh, thanks to the Navy League for putting on this conference. Uh, it's a fantastic conference and uh, certainly learned a lot being here the last couple of days. Uh, and I also appreciate uh, the good attendance in, at this, uh, at this uh, meeting here. My expertise, as Doug mentioned, covers the American commercial maritime industry. I spent 30 years with Crowley Maritime, uh, a dozen years on its leadership team, and then the last two years uh, as the president of the American Maritime Partnership, the domestic uh, uh, coalition supporting the Jones Act. I stepped back at the beginning of the year, uh, but am continuing to work with Crowley and AMP, and I'm also happy to have joined the Hudson team uh, last month. Uh, let me begin by saying that I'm a China hawk. It's probably a safe place to say that. <laughs> um, but it's only been about three years ago that I got very interested in China, and its geopolitical ambitions, and how the maritime, uh, commercial maritime industry plays into that. My two key takeaways are first, uh, that China has not behaved the way we expected when America, when America generously provided them with abundant work to help lift them from ad, out of abject poverty. Uh, in return, the Chinese Communist Party stole from us, have cheated on their commitments, and are implementing a strategy to overtake America as the economic and military leaders of a world that they would make much less free. Um, the support of uh, Putin's indefensible invasion of Ukraine is the most recent example of how they would rule. Uh, America's top priority must be to prevent the CCP from succeeding. My second takeaway is that the commercial maritime industry does play a key role in all of this. China's manufacturing and export economy coupled with strategic Chinese government in interventions has produced a commercial shipping and shipbuilding powerhouse. They build around 1,400 large commercial ships annually, as compared to just a handful uh, in the US. More than 6,000 large commercial ships fly the Chinese flag uh, around the world, uh, versus fewer than 200 flying the US flag. Of course, this is relevant to sea lift. China's maritime defense industrial base, which is a lot, uh, a large portion of which was developed to serve commercial customers, and U.S. consumers are the predominant end user, so we're paying for it. The Chinese maritime defense industrial base is fully able to resupply Chinese troops in an activation and really do whatever the CCP wants them to do uh, to improve its position in competition with America. And that's already happened in, in many instances. America's commercial maritime industrial base is orders of magnitude smaller than China's. We may not have to match China hull for hull or mariner for mariner, but when we look realistically at the picture today, one may question whether we have the resources we truly need. Before I go further, let me emphasize that the deficit in America's commercial maritime industrial base is on the international side of the coin. America's domestic maritime industry operates on a level playing field, thanks to the Jones Act. Uh, it accounts for the commercial vessels that are built in U.S. shipyards and provides about a third of the U.S. merchant mariners that would be needed in an activation. In contrast, international shipping operates under radically different rules uh, that put ships built, owned, and crewed by economically advanced uh, countries, America, at a prohibitive competitive disadvantage. Several foreign governments have put their thumbs on the scale 
to support their shipping and shipbuilding industries. China leads the way, providing roughly $15 billion annually for its shipping and shipbuilding sectors, according to the 2020 brief by CSIS. That's maybe 30 times what the U.S. government uh, provides to the American commercial maritime industry. The absence of a robust international commercial American shipping and shipbuilding industry might not matter in a Pax Americana world where global conflict is banished to the dustbin of history, but we've come to understand that's not the world we live in. So having a robust American maritime industry does matter. Back to sea lift. Thanks to what we've seen of Russia's supply lines in Ukraine, everyone now recognizes the importance of logistics in a military activation. Maritime logistics would, would be crucially important in a confrontation with China. If America had a robust defense maritime industrial base that was built and paid for predominantly in commercial markets, America's military would be able to draw as much capacity as it needs from those capabilities, like China can draw from its maritime industrial base today. But we don't have that kind of maritime industrial base. So what do we do about it? And I have two suggestions right now. First, we move ahead smartly with many of the suggestions that are already on the table. Uh, in domestic markets, we support offshore wind development, close gaps in the Jones Act with respect to offshore development, as Chairman Garamendi has mentioned, and defend the integrity of the Jones Act, which really shouldn't even be a discussion in these times. In international markets, we implement the 10-ship tanker security program, expand it and perhaps a maritime security program, in both cases understanding that the business case changes when more vessels, U.S. flag vessels, are chasing a finite amount of government cargo. We should also expand the, the scope of cargo subject to U.S. flag preference to the extent possible. Current initiatives for U.S. shipbuilding, including the NSMV, uh, series construction of, of sea lift vessels, and more com combatants that are militarily justified should move forward in the comments Monday uh, from Chairman Courtney and Rob Whitman, uh, we're, we're Representative Whitman, we're, we're encouraging. I must say that some of the, this seems backwards, uh, relying on DOD work to sustain shipbuilding capabilities at predominantly commercial yards but that's where we are today. Uh, these are important steps in the right direction, but they seem quite small when you look at the scope of the, at, uh, at the size of the China challenge. My second suggestion is that more fundamental change to our commercial maritime policy is called for, a change that enables dynamic and long-term growth of the American maritime industry in international commercial markets. Broadly, our maritime policy for decades, our commercial maritime policy for decades has been about survival, maintain a critical mass of Americans who know how to build and operate ships so that we have something to scale up if needed. That's not a winning strategy, as we are fully understand at this point. I'm not today gonna to get into what a winning strategy would look like other than to say that truly fundamental change in mindset and policy are needed. But if we agree that the status quo is not acceptable, in light of China and Russia and the supply chain crisis, uh, we need to work on changing it and understand that tinkering around the edges won't do the trick. And that's all I have at this point. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. So, hey, we'll, we'll jump into a few uh, questions for the panel that we have internally, and we'll talk about a few things, and then we'll open up the floor to any questions from the audience. So I, I think first I, I would say to uh, Admiral Schofield, um, we, we, we heard a little bit today about some of the initiatives you have. Are there any new capabilities for logistics that you're starting to look at in acquisitions, or are there any um, alignment that you require for distributed logistics? So, uh, <clears throat> talked a lot about in the Coast Guard uh, discussion this morning, uh, big data, and we're aligning, aligning to that with the, with the Navy. Um, and uh, I think that's the critical spot in the logistics pipeline, whether it's uh, getting logistics for the, the personnel um, to be battle ready, or the food, or the fuel, or the, um, or the parts and services that you need to support uh, uh, the work, the, the entire DOD network and Coast Guard. Um, that's really, really important. We gotta start with that big data. But within that big data, some things we can get around the edges um, uh, is common logistics systems. 
uh, and, and we are working on that across uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard uh, there. Um, but it's also more than that. It's where can we continue to, to look at common systems uh, and architecture across our platforms? That will certainly help in a distributed network out there, which will take less uh, sea lift uh, capacity potentially, uh, certainly in peacetime, but potentially in, uh, in, in a conflict scenario as well. So we got to continue to look at that. Um, and that's a big part of having, having uh, mitigating that risk across there. So common systems using uh, cloud-based data for all logistics-based systems. Um, and uh, I think that's where we're all going and looking forward to that in, in this artificial intelligence to understand those risks and have predictive analytics instead of metrics uh, uh, is really, really key there. So uh, I'm looking forward to more discussions on that. Thank you. So for Dr. Labs, um, we're, we've talked a little bit about how the, the, I don't want to call it the fight, but the competition for resources is there. So when we're in great power competition and we're in a peacetime economy. Are we able to make those two items work or are there changes or practices now that we need to change to be more ready? And this is for, for all the panelists, so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that there's necessarily a lot of practices or, or procedures that necessarily need to be changed. Although I'm certainly, you know, open to the idea. It seems to me that a lot of where the, if you want to say where the fault lies as to, to where we're at right now, I honestly probably comes from um, the priorities of leadership. In other words, leadership needs to sort of say that sealift recapitalization is got is something that has to be done, and it's not something that is, as I said, is particularly expensive. So. That, that is the type of thing that they need to make a, make a priority if you, if you want to be able to achieve it. Now, whether it all needs to come, you know, going through the Navy Department or whether there's other mechanisms by which, um, you know, which this can be done, I tend to agree with um, Mike that I'm interested in doing anything that's probably on the table that's out there. So you buy new, you know, buy new ships, buy new ships, expand the maritime security program to the extent that we can. Expand the expand the tanker security program, which admittedly is just getting underway, but you know, look at sort of doing that as well. I, I'm kind of like you know everything in the kitchen sink philosophy in terms of getting the sort of the, the, the sea lift modernization you know on the path that it needs that it needs to be on. Um, it, in terms of the one of the reasons that the Congress has been Congress has kind of been pushing this very hard, but at the same time they've also been trying to use mechanisms to push the Navy to sort of getting to getting sort of the new the, the the new ships being built as well. So they've, they, they, want the Congre they want the Navy to sort of start buying the used ships of which they give authorization for. That's why the, the, one of the reasons why the Senate was a little bit hesitant in the 2022 process about giving the 300 million to buy the five new ships is because the Navy hadn't acted on the, on the first two ships. Um, now that the, you know, the, the bill has been signed, they've, they've got a program going forward, but if they're restricting the, the Navy from getting too many of the used ships before they start building the new ships, this is, these are the levers that the Congress has to be able to, to push the Navy in this direction. And I think, I think all of that needs to be done and all of that needs to be, um, to be to utilized for, to, 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 to achieve that recapitalization that we need. Thanks. And for Mike, you, you know, a peacetime economy and, and relying on commercial partners, how, how do we get there? How, is there enough, is there enough uh, ways to interject that commercial partnership and in, in to make, a, make headway? So I'm, I, under the current policy framework, the answer obviously is no. Uh, and so that's the reason we need to change uh, the, the fundamental policies governing commercial maritime uh, shipping and shipbuilding. And I think as we think about that, and there's probably, you know, practically everybody in this room have, uh, have strong ideas about what needs to be done and how to fix that problem. Uh, I think, you know, perhaps as important as the content of what those recommendations are is the process is how we get to those recommendations because they will require legislation, tough legislation that will be opposed. Um, it will require diplomacy uh, in, in, tough, uh, in tough discussions. But I think there's probably more consensus there than we believe there is. But I think that process is really important. Second thing I, I, I would say about how we think about changing our, our commercial maritime policy is we need to use an overused cliche, we need to skate where the puck will be. Uh, we, we don't need to be skating where the puck was in World War II or in today, uh, but we need to look 
uh, at where it will be, and we need to think about that, I believe, in terms of what, where China creates vulnerabilities in our sea lift, in other areas of our economy, and, and, and understand those really, really well. And then what are the options for dealing with those vulnerabilities? Um, and, and come up with a good set of considerations there, and then, and then, uh, uh, and then you know, decide on something and have the process such that, and buy in with the process such that um, Congress will actually act on recommendations that, that come out of this. I think, I think that's the process that has to happen, and that process is really important. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So, Admiral, when we talk about service logistics and joint logistics and some of these alignments that you're talking about, we're doing that again in a peacetime environment now. How do we make sure that we're ready for war, or are there testing that you're going to do in that process to make sure that we've validated it? Yeah, so great, great point, Doug. Uh, I think the, the big piece there, and I, I keep mentioning the AI piece, the AI piece is the, the critical piece there because the complexity of gaming out the logistics needs for different scenarios uh, is, is challenging. We all know that because this is a, a very multivariable uh, problem. Um, so I think that's where we need to go because I think that uh, using AI to game out uh, the wartime piece and the logistics needs is really important. And I think secondarily, um, if you look back uh, on, on the, just the logistics path, but even the sea lift side, uh, we need to continue to really, um, to re what Mike's saying is, look at that system of systems, you know, Coast Guard's recapitalizing, Navy's recapitalizing, the commercial side, we're, we're struggling for uh, ship, ship repair in certain regions of the country. We need to look at this holistically uh, as well, because that's in, in times of war, uh, or conflict, um, we might need to build faster uh, and better, and we gotta be able to game that out with the overall uh, logistics footprint that we might game out with an, a, uh, a clean database of logistics needs and AI uh, doing those kind of war gaming scenarios. So I think that's the piece that we, we need to get to ultimately as, as a government, as industry, uh, in this logistics, very difficult logistics world. Thanks. So I, I think that brings up a, a, another question, and for Eric or, or, or Mike, are, are we organized the right way to, to make progress towards these, what, what I think, Eric, you talked about, everybody knows it. Um, are we organized the right way? Do we have the right authorizations from Congress, from the administration, from our own departments and our own services? Are, are we in the right frame of mind to, to make headway? Do you want to start with that? No, please. <laughs> you want to be friends with um, hmm. um, Well, I'm. Uh, Disclaimer. And I'll give you this. Uh, uh, so, Eric came down onto one of our ships, the Ray Reserve Force ships, in 2018, I think. So, yeah, it was 2018. so we've had a series of, of studies and we've had a series of looks and a series of assessments. So, I, I think we've, we've, we've studied this problem really well since before 2018. Right, that's right. And I, I don't know, it seems to me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly not. I wouldn't call myself an, you know, an expert on, on, on those types of issues, but from what I've seen, it seems to me that we have all the tools and mechanisms in place, we're just not using them. So, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the Congress gives the appropriation and they give the authority for the Navy either to build new ships or to acquire new ships. Um, it has been a very slow and dragged out process that they have, they have been pursuing on that, so we haven't made very much progress um, on that subject. Hopefully we will now with the 2022 act being passed and ostensibly five more ships, assuming they can get them at $60 million a piece, um, you know, they've got, the, they've, got the ability, they've got the ability and authority to do that. I'm, it's just not clear to me why the process is taking so long and why the Navy is not uh, accelerating, uh, accelerating this issue when, you know, from the turbo, I mean, everybody in this room I'm sure knows about the, you know, the turbo activation. That should have been an absolute warning bell to everybody in government who's interested in the sea lift and the naval and maritime enterprise that if you can't get your logistics fleet up and running when you, when you need it to be, um, something's gotta change. And whether that's the processes to change the, the, the composition of that fleet or just change using those processes that we already have to get that composition of that fleet changed and upgraded, um, it's something that, it, it, it's, a little bit of a, it's a little bit of astonishing that um, uh, it's taking as long as it is so far. Let's jump in. I, I mean, I think um, the, uh, the mechanisms that are in place now 
are, 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 are good. They've, they've developed over time, and I'm thinking in terms of how uh, uh, DOD uh, works with industry uh, to, to optimize the resources we have. Uh, so I'm thinking of the, uh, 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 the visa program in particular and, and the ability to, to, um, uh, to exercise the fleets and, and to, uh, uh, again, get the most out of what we have. Um, uh, and, I, and I have great respect for what our, our uniform services are doing uh, and, and with what with what they're given. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, and then I listen to my colleagues uh, talking about it from the commercial side of things and, and what's, you know, what's needed and what we're trying to lean forward to help you know, uh, prepare and deter uh, a fight uh, ultimately. And it's, uh, it's really, really impressive. Uh, and, and so I think, the, I think the, uh, the, the collaboration is there, it could always improve in, in different ways. Um, and I'm sure that as, if if we as we move forward, it will evolve and, and improve. But I but I I'm, I think the uh, uh, the the systems uh, writ large are, are 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 very good and very effective. I mean, Thanks, you, you might need to. Uh, I mean, there's obviously some things that need to be adjusted. I mean, if you're going to expand the maritime security program and the tanker security program, you're going to need, need some legislation to to authorize that. But it certainly seems to me that that Congress would be fairly receptive to that. So. Thanks. So we use the mobility capability requirements study to determine how much sea lift we need. And, and, and as we try to increase that, and, and Dr. Labs, you mentioned percentage, right? So that's really useful to us. Mike, you mentioned 30 times the number that our, our competitors would use. So when we talk about that, and, and Admiral, I'll lean on you for the acquisition side, how do we make it so that programs don't compete or within a program, the elements that you need don't compete with one another. So are, 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 is there a, a way that we cannot degrade an, an overall co capability, or is there a point of view that we can use? And I think maybe the system of systems you were talking about might lead us in that direction. Yeah, Doug, I, I think that's gonna take some, you know, whether it's legislative or across uh, industry and government uh, collaboration more to get after that, send those long-term signals, that long-term planning will help that. I know industry would probably be very receptive of that discussion sure. uh, because that sends, uh, there's a lot of capital expenditures in those long-term plannings, of course. So uh, we, we do that, uh, I think, in a little better in the, um, the operational uh, acquisition side and less on the logistics and the sea lift side uh, as a whole. So I think that's um, where we can continue to improve that collaboration across uh, government industry there. That's just a, my general comment, um, certainly. If, if, Doug, if, if I understand your question right, if you're talking about avoiding programs competing, I don't know if you're talking about inside the sea lift enterprise or you're talking about government writ larger, yeah. but I think either way, but especially government writ larger, anytime you've got a, you know, a fixed cap up to your mm -hmm. budget, you, I mean, resources are not unlimited. So by definition, programs are gonna compete with each other. Um, since you, if you can't afford to buy everything, that's why you have to have a strategy. You have to have a strategy because you have to, you have to set priorities, you have to pick and choose what's gonna be more important, what's lesser important, and therefore allocate resources accordingly. Given that, that goes back to my point earlier that it becomes down a question of sort of what are the priorities of leadership? How important is logistics, the logistics enterprise, sea lift in this process, uh, in the national security pro process and, uh, and endeavor? And it seems to me, and certainly as, fellow panelists have already noted, uh, Ukraine is showing that it's very important. If there's one thing that maybe you can take away as a positive from what's going on in Ukraine, at least this has been my, this is my personal perspective on this, I think it does show that, it would, I, I would like to think it's gonna show the Chinese Communist Party leadership that conventional war is a really hard thing. It's a really hard thing to conduct, and especially if you're gonna go across water, that makes it so much harder still. John Mearsheimer, the, the, the scholar out at the University of Chicago, he likes to use this phrase, the stopping power of water. The Chinese have certainly got the maritime capability to, to, to conduct you know, over water operations if they, if they choose to do so, but uh, Ukraine is showing you, it, it's sort of a useful reminder that, that it is going to be very difficult, and so that hopefully that will give them pause in sort of thinking about it in those terms. But nonetheless, if you've got a fixed top line, you, you have to make choices, and your strategy is, going to, is what's going to determine those choices. Thank you, Dr. Hi. Labs. So at this time, we'll open up the floor. Um, there is a microphone here in the center for anybody who'd like to 
to ask a few questions. I see a few already moving, so welcome. Thank you. Yes, I'm first. Uh, Brent Seiler from the Heritage Foundation. A question for the panel. Sorry if that wasn't loud enough. No, that's okay. We got it. Um, the question has, there's several studies. In 2019, I think the overall uh, shipping activity to the United States, just to keep the economy pre-COVID humming along, lights on, shelves stocked, cars running, was about 19,000 port visits. Now, of course, the sizes and the cargo change across that, but the scale is significant. And we're talking in several hundred ships. In the last study that I'm aware of in the late 80s that looked at sustaining a U.S. wartime economy it was about 650 or 660 or so, so ships in order to sustain the economy. What's your thoughts on that? What work's been done to make sure that the U.S. gets into a fight with China that could last a year or two, that we're able to sustain the wartime economy, understanding that you've got this requirement that you're trying to address right now of sustaining forward military operations? So I think I'll defer to Mike on that. That's uh, really a, a good question. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I, I, I think, uh, for, uh, so in terms of the difference in the numbers, obviously ships have gotten larger, they've gotten more efficient, use fewer mariners, um, all, all of that efficiency gain and, and uh, uh, gets competed through the system and, and benefits consumers and that's the way it's supposed to work. So that's a good thing. Um, the capacity, uh, I think when you compare capacity today to, uh, you know, pick a point in the past, which is, you know, the economist's dream, uh, but you, 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 I think the, the, the capacity of the American domestic maritime industry, at least, is, is uh, comparable to what it's been, if not larger, um, in, in recent decades. Um, uh, I think in the context of uh, an activation, um, uh, the likelihood of, of significant domestic American assets being pulled into a fight, particularly in China, seems pretty low. Um, the, uh, the ships in the domestic markets are custom built, uh, custom designed and built for the, the markets they serve. Uh, so Puerto Rico, Puerto, ships in the Puerto Rico trade, for example, are built with 53 foot cells because that's the largest size uh, container you can use on the interstate highway system Th that provides great savings for the uh, customers in the Puerto Rico trade. Uh, and it's very different than the 40 and 20 foot uh, container sizes you see in the international markets. And, and in an activation, I'm not sure a 53 foot container is, is, <laughs> is optimal. Um, uh, and, and then tanker sizes, again, are built, uh, tankers are built for the domestic market. Uh, handy sized tankers are, are ideal for the needs of, of uh, customers in the commercial market. So I think they're, 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 the, the, you know, the benefit uh, of our domestic fleet, and I'm focused on that right now, is, is in terms of the shipbuilding defense industrial base, in terms of the mariner industrial base, and the know-how that, that we have uh, as a result of our, our domestic uh, American maritime industry. And I think I'll add to that that you know, the National Sea Lift Directive um, NSD 28 was last written in 1989, and it requires we only maintain the minimum amount of government-owned sea lift. Uh, we don't want to compete with industry. We want that robust industry. So I, I think that we haven't seen that testing, and we've seen the degradation of the size of the fleet. Um, and corresponding with that is a decrease in the number of mariners available. So I, I think that they are interlocked, and I think it's one of our, our key concerns, at least in the maritime administration, it is as well. Sure. Yes, Rick Easton, retired uh, Navy surface warfare officer. First, I want to thank the panel for being here and addressing this issue. Um, maybe it's issues that go across a, a broad spectrum. But um, my question comes down to a couple of things. Do we today and going into the future even have the industrial base with so many other competing demands on what is arguably a, basically a full employment economy today to say double the sea lift and sustain it? And then uh, when we look at fighting a war with our peer competitors, sort of along the lines of, our, of the previous gentleman that asked the question, are the studies right and is there a place for our allies and partners uh, that don't affect the industrial base that we can grow, whatever the maximum is, you know, the Jones Act understanding what it's trying to protect, but how do we actually bring our combined force, allied force, sea lift capability to bear to make sure we can address peer competitor threats, which are two, China and Russia, one being principally maritime and the other having a maritime and land component. 
Um, I'm, I'll start off a little bit on the on the industrial base question. Uh, I guess my 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 question back to you would be, you know, under what time frame? So you are correct that you know our shipbuilding industrial base is going to be difficult to expand in any significant or meaningful way over the over where we're already at, unless we're willing to buy these ships from from uh, foreign manufacturers like say the Koreans or something like that. So if we're willing to buy sea lift ships from Korea, which is which would something that would be an anathema to the Congress. Um, to, to expand our own sea lift program um, with new construction would be very difficult and would take a, a good deal of time. It could be done, but it's going to take, you know, you're talking about more than 10 years, um, you know, building at, I'd say, maybe a rate of two or three per year spread over, you know, spread over, um, you know, various, various industries in which, in which to do that. Um, so that would be, in, in terms of the, the allies, I would think absolutely the allies should, would, would play a part in this. And, Japan and Korea certainly have a large maritime uh, industry, but and I'm certainly no no expert on alliance politics and things like that. But there's going to be a lot of comp diplomatic and interesting complications, sort of making all that work, and sort of a lot of planning that would that would be required to sort of work all that out. Um, going back to something that you know, sort of Brent's point in terms of because I think this feeds into this whole question of vulnerability in our in our economy. You know, a bunch of naval analysts out there have argued for some time that one of the ways to handle China is with a distant blockade strategy. And there may be a lot of merit and, 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 and logic to that. And so you can make the economic life difficult for China. But I think the US government needs to sort of assess that same strategy for us. If China seeks to pursue basically a blockade strategy for us, meaning, okay, we're not gonna use our vast maritime fleet to ship any goods to the United States, what kind of an effect is that going to have on us and our economy and our and our standard of living and way of life? And are, are we prepared to sort of live through that kind of an experience for a year or two if a, if a war should go on for that long? I don't know the answer to those questions, but I think this is definitely something somebody in the government ought to study and sort of do, do a hard examine, examination of and see if that can't be, those kinds of effects can't be ameliorated a little bit. Uh, and I'll jump, sure. jump in here if I may. So a uh, really good point this, uh, uh, with respect to um, impacts outside of you know a, a direct military conf confrontation of of the, uh, of the extreme disadvantage we have in terms of our mar maritime capabilities at this point. Um, and, and while I think looking at at, at uh, a, a radical improvement in our uh, commercial maritime policy is extremely important for purposes of sea lift um, and the conversation that we're having in this room, uh, it is also very important in terms of the vulnerability we have uh, just in, in peacetime commercial shipping um, exposure uh, to uh, uh, putting their thumb on the scales in different ways that we probably wouldn't even know about, um, uh, but continuing to sort of incrementally uh, disadvantage us uh, in our domestic economy. I also believe you know, that, that um, uh, we, the Belt and Road Initiative is something that we had, and that's a, that's a commercial maritime interest from a port development perspective uh, and a trade policy perspective. That needs to be addressed also. So there's a, there's a lot of areas of vulnerability that um, if we can address them effectively and take away sort of confidence on the part of the Chinese that they can uh, leverage those uh, advantages and, and, and take advantage of our vulnerabilities um, uh, by changing our policies and behaviors, uh, we'll deter war. We probably are not going to disconnect economically from China. That that just would be a bridge very difficult to to cross. But uh, but I think you know just waking up to the fact that we have tremendous vulnerabilities now, we need to do something about it. Thanks. You know, I'll add to that one one additional thing. And I noticed in ship repair uh, within the Ready Reserve Force, we've had major difficulties in obtaining materials. We've uh, obtaining uh, original equipment, manufacturer items obtaining labor um, that's affected either by COVID or by other travel restrictions. So that's a, it's a great detriment to our readiness overall. And it's something that we're constantly managing and, and applying an inordinate amount of resources to prepare or to has a hedge against. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Art Devins, um, common man, uh, <laughs> retired, <laughs> spent, spent about 40, 40 plus years in US shipbuilding. Um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've had a hand in just about every purpose built sea lift ship that we still have in our inventory, going back to MPS ships, fast sea lift ships, program manager of the LMSRs. Um, 
Eric, it's always good to see you. Uh, Admiral Schofield, I enjoyed uh, working with your folks at the Coast Guard last year. Mike, I've never met you, but I really, really like you. I, I, I appreciate <laughs> I like you too. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate your support of the Jones Act because uh, it's only through the Jones Act that we've managed to sustain, minimally sustain the few yards that we still have capable here in the United States of building commercial ships. Um, that and the MSP program also provide the vital jobs for, for, mar for mariners. And, the, you know, and I want to start by saying the MSP program is very, very important because what I'm about to say might sound negative toward the, the MSP program. We have to think through the money chain. You always have to follow the money when we do things. <laughs> so we just recently purchased two car carriers, 26-year-old car carriers, for a pretty good sum of money. $50 million, which sounds like a good deal for the U.S., but a new one cost about $88 million uh, in Asia. And you got to look at where, uh, and all, all the ships in the MSP are foreign built, as opposed to the Jones Act, where they're required to be U.S. built and employ U.S. Uh, shipbuilders and U.S. suppliers and keeping the money in the U.S., people that pay U.S. taxes. Um, so we bought these ships from an MSP operator that's whole, uh, and unfortunately the way that our merchant marine is today, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign company. So those ships are owned by Wilhelmus Wilhelmsen Lines, um, one of the largest car carriers in the world. Great company, uh, Norwegian company. Uh, where do they buy their ships? They buy them where they're, it's cheapest to buy them. So the ships that we just purchased were built in the 90s and they were Japanese built because they were the number one shipbuilder in the world in the 90s. Some of the ships on the MSP were built in the early 2000s. They were built in Korea. Why? The cheapest place to buy ships. So now we've paid uh, money, which goes back up through the mother company. And where's uh, Willenius Wilhelmsen Lines buying their ships today? They've got nine ships on order in 2021 in China. So we've kind of created a nice industrial-based program. It's just not for the United States. Right. Any comments? <laughs> So I, I wouldn't argue with you the, the approach. Uh, um, it's, it's not the ideal approach. Um, I, I'm the program manager for the two ships that we're purchasing that are coming from the MSP operator. Um, it, it's a crisis in sea lift. And I, I can go back two years, three years in the panels that I've been on, and every one of them talks about it being a crisis. Right. I can't make it go any faster. I think Eric's talked about, we all know the urgency. We've studied the problem magnificently. We have incredible data that even the Admiral Schofield's talked about, but it's a, a willingness to go forward and to select new construction. We, we, we just have to understand where the money is going forward. The 20 years or almost 20 years the ship spent in the MSP, those companies and why they had a U.S. flag company is to get access to preference cargo. That's revenues going to that company. So you have the stipend. That's money going to the, to the, to the parent company. And then at the end of their service life, when we've pretty much already paid for the ship because of the serv service, the, 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 the revenues we've, we've paid to that company, we, pay, we buy them again for $50 million, well, so, and they're uh, buying I'll, new ships for 88 in yeah, China. I'll disagree with you on that we paid for the ship through the program because the, the ship construction, ship depreciation, that's a, it's its own science that we're oh, trying I, to I, get I, on I understand on top that science of very, so, very well. Um, we, we are happy to say that the MSP program benefits with oh, mariners absolutely. that we cannot run a merchant marine without. And I agree with you For on that. every dollar spent on an MSP ship, we're getting two crews, not one. I agree I'll with tell you, in the RRF, the, that's the, the program I'm managing, we have nine people on our average ROS that's, ship. That's why I preface this by saying the MSP is so important, but we have to understand what we have just done as we have just purchased ships where the money is flowing to a company who's buying their new ships in China. Thank you. Can, can I just comment on that? I, I, we, uh, as, as the tanker security program was being worked on, we took a look at what it would mean uh, from a, an economic, business economic standpoint uh, to have a, a requirement or an option of using a, a U.S. built vessel in that program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then a, a different stipend for a U.S. built tanker versus a foreign built tanker. And that's, that's something that can be, it's a, it's a lot of money. It, it changes the dramatics, the, the economics dramatically, at least it did when we were looking at it a couple of years ago. Um, 
like you say, it's it's all about money and 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 the will to and, and I think the the, the American shipbuilding uh, industrial base uh, uh, has to, you know it gets better with a strategy, a a, a true national strategy that in, in, includes Navy and and commercial shipbuilding and, and Coast Guard and, and, and the full gamut of of hulls and money and and that's industrial policy which is you know dirty phrase for, for, for in many quarters for a long, long time, but it's, and, and you know, we've had a very, very great economy for many years um, with high GDP every, every year, uh, thanks to the, our, our, our tendency to get, to avoid industrial policy and picking winners and losers and all that stuff, and I get that, but this is where it left us, and, and we are, it's not an acceptable position in my opinion. Uh, this is John Kaskin, uh, Navy League uh, Vice President for Legislative Affairs. Uh, when I first got into the Pentagon in 87, uh, I had a discussion with uh, colleagues at the Maritime Administration about economic security issues because I said if the Maritime Administration didn't take on economic security as one of its primary issues with the mar maritime industry, then you're going to default to the Department of Defense to fund your merchant marine. And uh, that was okay for of period of time, but we've come to the point now, uh, and when we had the peace dividend, nobody really cared the act, w with the position that Mike was talking about, uh, where we could uh, not worry about who was uh, moving our cargo on our ships. There was no economic security concerns. As Brent highlights now, we have come back to a different situation. But because the Department of Navy and, and Defense became the default source of resources, it now becomes subject to the priorities, as Eric has, has talked about, on where it's going to get funding on that list. And so from the Maritime Administration, from when there was, uh, from the early times of the Mercurine Act with the CDS and the ODS programs where it was building an industrial base, both for economic as well as military capabilities, we're down to the situation where the Navy has lost interest in it. As the, as the Congressional panel uh, discussed uh, on, uh, on uh, Monday, uh, there is, they're looking at other ways of, of funding uh, and re-looking at the Maritime Administration as a potential um, taking the lead on this again if they can be given the resources. So, I mean, uh, I just want to get your perspectives. If you think that there's a time for the sea change for the, for the Maritime Administration to, to retake on its mantle for economic and national security purposes and start taking the lead on this program, and getting a merchant marine that will be able to provide sea lift and economic security and no longer have to depend on reserve ships. I mean, remember, all but five, now I guess six ships or five or six ships in the RRF are special mission ships. All the rest of them are ex-commercial ships that were actively operating the merchant marine. If we had enough of those types of vessels and had a program that would generate that, uh, wouldn't we, we wouldn't even need uh, a ready reserve force we would have a larger merchant marine. Do you think that this is a time for a sea change in, uh, in how to do this, uh, how to uh, get our sea lift and uh, economic merchant marine in the future? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. John, first of all, thank you for your service um, in, in the Navy for many years. You, you were uh, fantastic in your continued service with the Navy League. Um, I think you had the, the, uh, the, the, the extreme challenge of, of dealing with these issues uh, at the end of the Cold War. And when, you know, you remember the report that came out from the DOT inspector general early in the Clinton administration says, we really don't even need a maritime industry. Um, and that's kind of the, the headwinds that we were facing at that point in time. And, and I would say it's, you know, it took 25 years before most people started to think about maybe that wasn't the right set of policies. Um, and, and, but at this point, uh, I think the, the turning point between the pandemic and, and Russia invading Ukraine and all of us are kind of understanding the, the challenge of China, I think we may be at an inflection point where we can put on the table, you know, smart policy changes that, 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 uh, that could get uh, traction and get it enacted. You'd be thinking about the heady days of the end of history back when there's like history. <laughs> um, I, for, let me answer your question. I'll, I'll start off by saying that um, I've, I've known John Caskin and Art Divins a long time, and a lot of what I know about this field I learned from them. So that, that being said, <laughs> I right. thank them for their, their, their friendship and service over the years as well. I, I, again, I can't get into the business of advocating a policy one way or the other. I would simply observe 
that uh, the Navy's expertise is in the building of warships. It is not their expertise in the building of, of commercial and commercial ships. Or um, honestly, they don't spend a lot of effort uh, in logistic ships as well. So, in that sense, uh, looking at looking at the advantages and disadvantages of all alternative mechanisms of managing the program um, certainly would be warranted. Well, I think by seeing how many blue suitors are in the audience or up on the podium, I think you, I think uh, the answer is obvious. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good segue. I'm John Grykowski. I'm with Philly Shipyard. And good to see you, Doug. Hi, John. We're a year into the NSMB program. And I think based on Acting Administrator Leslie's testimony last week, Mr. Courtney, Mr. Whitman, there's a growing perception that it's working. And it was a tremendous risk that Marriott took to develop this contracting model. It's different than any other way ships have been built for the government. Uh, the principle of benefits for us as taxpayers and also for Philly is, number one, it's a firm fixed price contract. Number two, it allows Philly to maximize commercial building practices. Consequently, we're building five very complex ships at an average cost of $300 million a piece. So my question is, if, and I firmly believe it's going to prove to be a success, does the VCM model in particular have ac applicability, and I think you just referred to changing sort of the perceptions, uh, applicability across the class of um, uh, auxiliary ships. I mean, the CHAMP program, we were in the design study, comes out at a billion dollars, <laughs> and it's a ship, you know, and it carries stuff. And we're owned by Norwegians, and I was former chief or general counsel there, and they never could understand how a ship could cost a billion dollars. Couldn't. So I would urge some thinking along those lines and ask also what are the impediments to converting it? I think there may be applicability able to the Coast Guard programs as well by maximizing commercial standards because the Navy will say they want to move toward commercial standards, but it never quite seemed to get there or their conception of commercial standards isn't quite what our conception is. So start with Doug. I mean, my we think the program's going well. The relationship with Tote and Tote with Marad. So important. thanks, John. The vessel construction manager approach is a viable approach, and I think I, I've been up there to Philly. I've seen the right. ship, um, and I will give credit to Navy. Navy put some seed money in it, that helped us develop that design way a, a long time ago. Um, the there was also assistance money that was provided to keep a workforce at Philly, mm -hmm. and that came through Jazz and Ships. So without Navy thinking about this, looking forward, planning, trying to keep this workforce and that capability there, uh, we would be in a different position. But I think vessel construction manager as an idea is, is a good approach. You know, we modeled the vessel acquisition manager for the used ships after that right. approach where we're not putting all of these federal government employees on board that platform. We're trying to leverage a commercial capability that already exists. So while VAM is not the ideal approach, um, vessel construction manager is one, and we have any number of ships that we need to recapitalize. You know, we operate two National Defense Reserve Fleet ships for the Missile Defense Agency today. Um, both of those need to be recapitalized. One of them is a steamship. Um, and, and there are areas that we see that VCM model could be used in other areas, other shipyards, other partnering and teaming arrangements. And just as a former Marad guy, I'd be perfectly happy to have Marad just keep managing the program and building ships and filling. Yeah, well, that's a well, thanks, John. Comment. I think my boss is around here. So yeah, Kev's yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. So. Hey, so um, unless we have any further comments from the panel, I did want to thank them all for coming on board today. Um, you know, being up here on a panel, we're trying to um, provide the best quality information that we can. We speak to the limits of our authority as best we can. Sometimes we offer um, what is our opinion. Uh, you know, and some of these are tough questions. So you want to give the, the best opinion that you can of what's right for the nation and our programs going forward. So thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Um, I've gotten the hook from Karen, I think. So um, thank you to the Navy League. And again, I'm happy to take any further questions after the event. Thanks.